Safety, narrated by Lisa Shiver. I'm going to start this lecture with some general information about safety. Safety is defined as freedom from psychological and physical injury. It is essential for all clients' well-being. In determining if our patient is safe or not, the nurse must use critical thinking skills and the nursing process for assessment of possible environmental hazards, which we're going to talk about a little bit more. Environmental safety is all physical and psychosocial factors that influence the life and survival of a client. And this can include not only the hospital, where we traditionally think of taking care of our patient's safety, but it includes the home, clinics, uh, schools, community centers, and also long-term care facilities as well. When creating a safe environment, we must reduce the risk factors. We also must control transmis transmission of pathogens. Sanitation must be maintained, pollution controlled, and threat of attack prevented. And we're going to talk about each one of these a little bit more in detail. First, let's consider the developmental stages of safety. As we grow or age, our risk for safety changes. For example, with infants and toddlers or preschoolers, injuries are the leading cause of death. With school-aged children, safety is going to depend on one, the parents, teachers, and also nurses. How well are we teaching our children um, about being safe? With adolescents, we see greater independence and they're a little more willing to take risks or we start seeing those risk-taking behaviors. With adults, it all depends on your lifestyle habits. Are you a smoker? Do you drink alcohol? Use drugs? And there are many other issues with an adult safety as well. With older adults, we see safety risks related to weakness or decreased strength as well as lack of coordination or decrease in sensory perception. Maybe their vision is not as good as it was or their hearing is poor. So as we age, our safety risks are actually going to change as well. An important note that I put at the bottom that I want you to be aware of, all developmental stages may be subject to abuse, and nurses must report abuse if it's suspected, and that may be uh, physical abuse, uh, it may be sexual abuse, but as a nurse, we are required to report any abuse if we suspect it and all age groups are subject to abuse. Looking at some more individual risk factors, I mentioned especially with the adults, we see more usage of drugs and alcohol. Um, adults and adolescents are more likely to take risks. Also impaired mobility, I mentioned that with the older populations and then the sensory or communication issues and that's referring to visual, hearing or tactile deficiencies with the older populations. Let's talk a little bit about risk management issues. Risk management is defined as the system of ensuring appropriate nursing care that attempts to identify potential hazards and eliminate them before harm occurs. And essentially what that means is we're making the healthcare environment a safer environment. Usually this is headed up by a risk management nurse. This person, or it might be a team of people, identify possible risks, analyze the risk, acts to reduce the risk, and then evaluates the steps taken to reduce that risk. And if you notice, that's actually using the nursing process where we assess, uh, plan, implement, and then evaluate. The risk management nurse will also accurately document assessments and findings and then report any significant changes in client's condition. Risk management issues that we see in the healthcare environment, a big one is environmental safety, especially in the hospital setting. Medical errors are the eighth leading cause of death. Uh, we also have issues with falls. Falls are a huge risk in the hospital setting as well, especially with our older populations. 
We have errors due to system failures, and this could be maybe a computer error, or maybe lack of communication, or maybe a procedure or a policy that has errors within it. Chemical spills are also risk management issues, and on each unit we should have MSDS sheets, which stand for Material Safety Data Sheets, which address how to handle exposure to any chemicals that may be found on any of the units. So make sure you know where your MSDS sheets are on your unit. Also, incident reports. Um, when an incident report is completed, it is important to note you need to include the facts, be honest. People do make mistakes, but the incident report does not end up being part of the patient's permanent record. So incident reports never become part of the patient's medical record. Talk a little bit more about falls and accidents in the healthcare setting. 90% of reported incidents in hospitals are actually falls. Maybe it's in, due to the increase in elderly because of their age or gait problems, and we already mentioned how they have problems or decreased uh, sensory perception. We see issues with bed to toilet transfers. It could be related to drug interactions. Maybe we're giving a patient two medications that are working against each other and are causing the patient to be, maybe their blood pressure is low or maybe causing more sedation than we would normally see. So it could be drug induced. As a result of these falls, hip fractures are the most serious result and it can be prevented. To make sure we have a safe environment, of course, we want to make sure there's adequate lighting for the patient. We want to remove any obstacles that we can remove. Extrinsic, extrinsic obstacles include cords or furniture. You know, make the room a little more user-friendly for the patient. Um, eliminate obstacles in the room. The intrinsic obstacles include things that are inside the patient or the patient itself. Maybe the illness itself has caused them to be weak or the medications that were given the patient has caused weakness or decrease in their sensory perception. So we need to eliminate as many obstacles, whether it be extrinsic or intrinsic as possible. Also in the bathrooms, there are bathroom hazards. We need grab bars and call lights. Um, and make sure the patients know that those are there so they can utilize them. Smoke detectors are, should be found throughout all facilities. Uh, put some non-slip socks on your patient if you think they're a fall risk. And then we need to identify all patients that are at risk for falls and different facilities use different procedures for doing that. Some may have an armband or identify uh, those patients in different ways. So if you see that patient walking alone, then you know to go assist them. With procedure-related accidents, we have many, many, many medication and fluid administration errors. Make sure if you get orders that you don't understand or they don't look correct, make sure you clarify it. It is amazing how many people um, actually are hospitalized and have a medication and fluid administration error while they're there. Preventative measures that we can use, make sure we follow our policy and procedure for med administration. A joint commission actually requires that the patient have two patient identifiers, meaning the patient will have to tell you their name and their birth date before you can administer medication in the hospital setting. Um, and just a good rule of thumb is double check, double check, double check. Also maintaining medical and surgical asepsis is considered a procedure related accident. If we break sterile field and we do nothing about it, that is considered an accident. It is more cost effective to go maybe get another Foley kit and start over with a Foley because you contaminated than it would be to go ahead and put a contaminated Foley in a patient and them have to be hospitalized or possibly even die because they got uroseptic. So if you do contaminate equipment, 
um, go get new stuff. I can't emphasize that enough. With equipment related accidents, usually it results from malfunction, disrepair, or misuse of equipment. If you don't know how to use something, you'll break out the um, instruction manual. Or if we have equipment that does not work, make sure that's reported so it can be corrected as soon as possible. Read the instructions before use. Uh, usually there's safety checklists that have to be done. And then of course, always follow the hospital or the healthcare facility policy. With incident reporting, incidents or occurrences are one of the tools used with risk management, which we already mentioned. And an incident is actually defined as any event that is not consistent with the routine operation of a healthcare unit or routine client care. So anything out of the norm is actually considered an incident. So follow policies and procedures of your agency. Next, I want to talk a little bit about body mechanics. And this is more looking at us as the healthcare worker. It is important to keep the patient um, in proper body alignment, but we also need to consider what we're doing when we're caring for the patient. So we use proper body mechanics to reduce the risk of injury to the client and yourself. You must know how to practice proper body mechanics, and this includes body alignment, balance, and coordinated body movement. As the healthcare worker, we need a wide base of support. So a good idea is to, when you're moving a patient, separate your feet, get a good wide stance, because it's harder to lose your balance if you have a good wide stance. Lower your center of gravity, bend your knees and flex your hips a little bit. Face the direction that you want to move. Divide balance activity between your arms and legs so you're not overusing your arms or your legs. And it's a lot easier to use rolling or turning or pivoting instead of just lifting weight. Reduce friction between objects. Uh, we have slider boards that we can use for patients. Um, it's a lot easier if we can reduce the friction. We won't have to work as hard to move a patient. And of course, maintain good body mechanics. With safety devices, we're focusing on restraints. Restraints could be a chemical or physical device used to immobilize a client or extremity. Restraints will restrict the freedom of movement or normal access to a person's body. And there are many, many reasons that we may need to use restraints on a patient. But when we start dealing with restraints, documentation is going to be key. Always, always attempt the least restrictive measures first and document that response. And what I mean by that is if a patient is combative or in danger of hurting their self, you want to verbally try to calm the patient first. That is the least restrictive measure. Then we may move to uh, chemical measures or maybe give them medication to help calm the patient. The last resort would be a physical restraint where we're actually having to restrict their movement. So always, always the least restrictive measure first and make sure you document that. The objectives of restraints are to protect the client from injury. We may use restraints to prevent interruption of therapy. And a good example of that is the next bullet there. Uh, patients that are in the ICU that are intubated uh, they may have tubes and wires and they may try to extubate their self. So if the patient is confused or combative, we may actually have to restrain them to prevent them from removing life support devices. Uh, we may use restraints to reduce the risk of injury to others and patients on the psychiatric unit may need restraints for this reason. But again, you always always will try the least restrictive measure first. The goal, the least amount of restraint for the shortest amount of time. So if we do have to physically restrain a patient, maybe with a vest restraint or wrist restraints or leather restraints, you want to do it for the shortest amount of time. Again, start with your verbal, 
try to calm the patient. Then we may move to chemical and then mechanical would be last. If you jump from maybe the patient is being, or the patient's agitated, maybe they're being a little combative trying to crawl out of the bed and you go straight to the mechanical, this can constitute false imprisonment. Restraints and seclusion should only be used to protect the client or others. And again, it is used as a last alternative. There are some guidelines with physical restraints. You need to assess the need for restraint, assess the patient's behavior, and of course, always know what your facility policy is. Explain the purpose to the client and family. Inspect the area where the restraint is to be placed. Make sure you approach the client in a calm manner, provide privacy, and make sure you have the proper uh, size restraints. One thing to note about the family, sometimes if the family is actually present in the room, we may be able to avoid the use of restraints because having the family present, that's another set of eyeballs watching the patient, and that can also increase the amount of safety you're providing for the patient. So when a patient does have a lot of visitors or family present, sometimes we think, oh no, they've got family in the room, there's more people watching me, but that's actually more people watching your patient when you're not in there as well. So that's a good thing. With a restraint order, you must have documentation of the least restrictive measure did you try verbally calming the patient? Did we try chemicals or medicines to try to calm the patient? You need to have a written doctor's order that specifies what type of restraint to use. We can't, you, we can't have an order restrain PRN. That is not acceptable. The doctor has to specify he wants a vest restraint or extremity restraints or even side rails up times four. Don't forget that if you put all the patient's side rails up, that is considered a restraint. There also are time limitations to how long you can restrain a patient, and the doctor has to specify that. He can't just say, oh, we'll restrain them PRN. Every 15 minutes, we have to lay eyeballs or look at the patient and do ongoing documentation of their condition. So every 15 minutes, we will be assessing the patient. At intervals, we will also offer toileting fluids, release the restraints, and actually offer range of motion, which may be active, it may be passive. We need to evaluate the client's response. What would you do in an emergency situation when you couldn't get that doctor's order? If you go ahead and restrain a patient because they are being combative, that is okay, but you better get that doctor's order ASAP. Alternatives to restraints, orient the client and the family to the surrounding, and again, having the family there, if they will stay, that is actually awesome because that's increasing the amount of safety that your patient will have. Provide appropriate visual and auditory stimuli, so sometimes distracting the patient may help calm them a little bit, or using relaxation techniques. Make sure we evaluate all their medications. Could one of their medications be causing the um, abnormal behaviors? And also exercise or ambulation, if appropriate, may actually help the patient relax as well. Next, we're going to talk a little bit about disaster management. A disaster is defined as any unexpected event whose effect leads to significant destruction and or adverse consequences. I think we all are familiar with what disasters are. External disasters um, can be anything outside the hospital environment. Now, will that impact the hospital or the healthcare facility? Absolutely, because the patients are going to start coming in for medical care. Nurses play an important role in the planning, implementation, and disaster relief efforts. So when you have the opportunity to go get involved in maybe a community disaster drill, that would be a great experience because that helps plan and prepare for what's going to happen You know, if a disaster were to occur. Uh, there's a lot of collaboration with community agencies and the American Nurses Association along with other agencies are actually uh, 
uh, facilitating our role in external disasters or disaster management. A couple agencies you need to be familiar with, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, more commonly known as FEMA. This is a central federal agency for emergency planning. So they're always planning ahead, uh, planning for the what if. CDC, or the Center for Disease Control, is also a leading federal agency. This one is designed to protect the health and safety of people at home and abroad. The Homeland Security Act. The Department of Homeland Security, or the DHS, was established to provide a unifying core as the basis for efforts to prevent and deter terrorist attacks. And this all evolved after September 11th, uh, 2001. It's designed to coordinate the efforts of an extensive network of organizations that essentially are put in place to help secure and maintain the safety of the nation. So. Uh, the Homeland Security Act is basically where all these agencies were brought together to actually work together to prevent and deter future terrorist attacks. But there still is bioterrorism out there. Uh, bioterrorism is defined as biological or chemical agents that can be used against a group or a population or a country. First responders play a critical, critical, critical role. Um, you will study more about this later in the nursing program when you talk about emergencies, but knowing what to do as a first responder and again going to get that education for those disaster drills is so important. Not only do we have to consider our individual patient when there's an external disaster, but you have to consider the whole community. You have to consider the community needs. So make sure you get into uh, participating in the development of dis disaster plans if that is ever um, available to you. Internal disasters, these are the ones that happen within the hospital setting. And this could be a fire, for example. It is our role to protect the client from immediate injury as the nurse. And you can use the mnemonic RACE or RACE uh, when we're talking about a fire. The R stands for rescue and remove all clients in immediate danger. A, activate the alarm. C, confine the fire. And E, extinguish the fire. Other measures to ensure a safe environment include, again, smoke and fire alarms, a plan of action in case of fire, and we're going to go by the race mnemonic. Uh, electrical, we want to make sure electrical equipment's in good working order, which we've already mentioned. And then chemicals, we need to store chemicals out of reach, make sure they're stored properly. Um, and this outside the hospital would apply to the home environment even. We want to make sure we have fire alarms or smoke detectors, make sure our electrical equipment's in good working order, and make sure those chemicals are out of reach of children. There are levels of disaster prevention, and I want you to be somewhat familiar with these. You're going to see these again later. Primary level, this is where we're in the preventative mode. We're developing a plan, we're training, we're educating, we're practicing, so we're getting ready in case of emergency. What would we do? The secondary level is where we're actually, we've had a disaster where we need to triage patients, and I'll talk about triage in just a minute, but we also will be um, providing treatment to victims of the disaster and shelters, so the disaster has actually occurred. With tertiary level, this is where we have the follow-up, the recovery, and then the future prevention. So we've had a disaster, what can we do in the future if this ever were to occur? Just to clarify what triage means, because I mentioned triage there with the secondary um, level. Triage is to sort or categorize victims or patients based on criteria. It's based on what is the patient's potential for survival and what are your available resources. So sometimes we're having to do a quick assessment on patients to see what is their potential for survival and what resources do we have immediately available that can help that patient. 
The goal of triage is to maximize the number of survivors. If you've ever had to go to the emergency room as a patient, you went through triage, and that's the process of they're basically looking at you know, whose life is in most jeopardy and make sure, making sure that they receive care first or they have priority care as opposed to maybe who, somebody who doesn't have an acute illness. Let's talk a little bit about medical and surgical asepsis. I want to first define asepsis. Asepsis is defined as the absence of pathogenic myco microorganisms, excuse me, um, in other words, without bacteria. Clean technique, also known as medical asepsis, includes procedures to reduce and prevent the spread of microorganisms. Sterile technique is when we have surgical asepsis, and this is when there is no microorganisms present. So let me clarify what this is. Asepsis means there are no germs. So when we have medical asepsis, this might just be clean technique, meaning we've washed our hands, we've cleaned the area. With sterile technique, that's a little bit different in that all the microorganisms have been removed. We're dealing with sterile fields, sterile gloves, and this would be a surgical setting. With clean technique, we can perform good hand hygiene. We can use the alcohol-based foam rubs where we foam in and foam out. And we also use clean technique with clean dressing procedures. Sterile technique are used during procedures that intentionally break the skin, such as surgery, trauma. If we have a burn patient, we'll be using sterile technique. Of course, if you're doing a sterile dressing, that is also a sterile technique, or procedures that involve insertion of catheters into sterile body cavities. And the one that comes to mind immediately would be the insertion of a Foley catheter because your GU tract is sterile, so you use sterile technique inserting a Foley. The principles of sterile technique. A sterile object is sterile only when touched by another sterile object. Only place sterile objects on your sterile field. Another important thing to note is sterile field can be contaminated by prolonged exposure to air. So just because we haven't touched it doesn't mean it's still sterile. So we don't need to have our sterile field open for a prolonged period of time. Another thing I want to mention that is not on this slide is once a sterile field becomes wet, it is no longer sterile. Remember, wet equals bacteria. One inch or 2.5 centimeters around the border of a sterile field is considered contaminated. So if you're working with a sterile field, make sure you put all your supplies in the middle of your sterile field. I'm going to finish up with a little bit about infection control. I'm going to talk about types of immunity. There are several different types of immunity I want to just mention briefly. Natural immunity is the first one, and this is one that is specific to um, the fact that we are human beings. Because we are humans, we cannot get feline leukemia. That is our natural immunity. That means we are genetically programmed as humans. There are just certain diseases we cannot get. With active immunity, that means your immune system has taken an active role to make antibodies to protect you. And there are two different ways that active immunity can occur. The first one is natural active immunity. This means you've been sick. Because you have been sick, you have developed antibodies. Your immune system develops those antibodies, so hopefully you'll be protected the next time you're exposed to whatever that antigen or whatever that germ was. So with natural active immunity, you develop, your immune system develops because you have been sick. And a good example of that is chicken pox. Once you have chicken pox, your body develops antibodies against chicken pox, so therefore you shouldn't get chicken pox again. You're protected.
The second type of active immunity is artificial active immunity. This we get through immunization. We go get shots as a child. Um, we get the hepatitis B injections to help protect us from getting sick. What happens though is we are not actually sick with this uh, virus, but we get an immunization which triggers our immune system, therefore our immune system does make antibodies against this virus. So it is called artificial active immunity. With passive immunity, this is a little bit different. The immunity is actually passed to the patient. The first example is the natural passive immunity. And this is the best example of this would be mom when she has a baby. She passes her antibodies to the baby. Did the baby's immune system make those antibodies? No, but these are antibodies that were passed from mom to the baby. The second type is artificial passive immunity. And I've got the HBIG injection listed there and also rabies. What happens with artificial passive immunity is, for example, if you were exposed to hepatitis B and you didn't get immunizations against hepatitis B, we could actually give you a shot of hepatitis B antibodies. They were made somewhere else, but we could give them to you, therefore you would be protected. Same thing with rabies. If somebody gets bit by a rabid animal, uh, we, we can give them rabies antibodies in a series of injections that will keep the patient from developing rabies. So is their immune system doing anything to create antibodies? No, we're actually giving, giving them to the patient through a passive process. Healthcare associated infections. Do you want to talk a little bit about the healthcare acquired infection? This is formally known as nosocomial infections. These are infections that were not present the time the patient was admitted to a healthcare setting. So that means they got them while they were in the hospital. And that just should not happen. Community-acquired infections are present when a patient was admitted to the healthcare facility. Maybe they got that infection or they were exposed to whatever when they were at Walmart or at Target shopping. So community-acquired they got while they were outside the hospital in the community. Healthcare-acquired infections are those that they get while they're in the hospital, which again, shouldn't happen. Modes of transmission may include contact and also air. With contact, you may have direct contact, meaning person to person or physical contact, which cause the spread of the germs. It could be indirect contact, meaning you had personal contact with a susceptible host with an inanimate object. And that inanimate object could be a blood pressure cuff or a stethoscope or what I like to call a MRSA scope. Think how many times you've touched a patient with your stethoscope and how many people or how, how much you have spread germs from person to person to person. So make sure we're cleaning those inan inanimate objects. Third kind of transmission is the droplet or contact through droplets. And this may be through sneezing, coughing, or talking. There's also the air as a mode of transmission. This is where droplet nuclei may be suspended in the air, may be transmitted to others. We're gonna talk more of each of these in just a minute. Lab tests to screen for infection. Uh, we're all familiar with white blood cell counts. Um, keep in mind this could be elevated due to an acute infection could be decreased in certain viral infections. But again, our general white count should run 5,000 to 10,000 in an adult, and that may vary depending on your facility. Um, also, stress can elevate your white blood cell count a little bit. So it's not always due to infection. It could be related to something else. Your erythrocyte sedimentation rate or your SED rate. This is a blood test that can be done that indicates 
chronic inflammation or the presence of an inflammatory process. So the doctor may check a sed rate on a patient who suspects there might be a chronic ongoing inflammation occurring. Cultures, cultures of different body fluids, typically we think of blood, urine, sputum, should be sterile without the growth of microorganisms. So when we do get a positive culture report, that may indicate that the patient has infection. Standard precautions shall be observed to pre prevent contact with blood or other potentially infectious material. This is implemented for work practice control to eliminate employee exposure. We must have accessible hand washing facilities in all of our um, agencies. We must have good hand hygiene practices and no food should be kept where blood products are present. And that goes back to the no food or drinks in the nurse's station or in the patient care area. Let's talk a little bit more about standard precautions. Tier one includes that your hands are washed. Gloves are to be worn when touching body fluids. And this doesn't say we can tear the finger out of our glove when we are starting an IV. Okay, you shouldn't have any holes in your glove. Also, another good rule of thumb is if you're sticking your hand somewhere you can't see, for example, up under your patient to maybe help them up in the bed, it's a good idea to put gloves on as well. Masks are to be worn for splash occurrences. Gowns are to be worn if soiling of clothing is likely. And equipment should be cleaned properly. And this goes back to our blood pressure cuffs and our stethoscopes. Make sure you discard your sharps instruments properly in a rigid biohazard container. Tier two of standard precautions. This involves the airborne precautions. Uh, we may have to use a mask, private room, or even negative airflow of patients on airborne precautions. Measles and TB are cases that uh, patients would need airborne precautions. With droplet precautions, we may need a mask or a private room, and this goes back to mumps. Mumps, you would need droplet precautions. Contact precautions, which is probably the more common of any of those, this is where you wear gloves and gown. The patient should be in a private room and have positive airflow. And examples of these would be if a patient had MRSA or scabies. It's not so much to protect us as it is to keep us as the healthcare worker who goes from patient room to patient room to patient room from spreading MRSA. With personal protective equipment, gowning will prevent soiling of the clothes. Uh, you may need full face protection if any splashing may occur. And it's hard to know if splashing will occur or not, but if you're dealing with a procedure that may be bloody or juicy, that's a good idea to put uh, full face protection on. I always wear gloves, prevent transmission of pathogens by direct or indirect contact. If you begin to think like a nurse and think about infection control and safety and all that you do. For your independent skill review on your own time, I want you to review the different types of restraints, and that does include the vest restraints, um, the wrist restraints, or the extremity restraints, and also look at re leather restraints, and we will play with those a little bit when we go to the lab. Also how to put on restraints, and then look at the appropriate way for applying the personal protective equipment, and what I mean by that is tying the mask, putting on the gowns, and also look at sterile gloving. And if you have to do a mask, glove, and gown, in what order do you do that in? And in what order do you take it off?